So I'm a woman, and I work in the STEM field, mathematics to be exact. I'm a professor at Stanford University. And in 2012, I shared with the world how my work had been attacked by white male mathematicians. I had for many years been sharing messages of equity and how when we open mathematics and make it more visual and creative and give different messages to learners, equitable outcomes result. Not everybody wants to hear this message, though. And some people who are inside the STEM castle want to keep the doors shut or only invite other people into the castle who look like them and seem like them. So these mathematicians came after me with a serious weapon. They accused me of academic misconduct. This is a very serious claim. Stanford, by law, had to investigate. They investigated and found there was nothing uh, accurate in the claim, so they ended the investigation. But the men went to the internet and started spreading lies and accusations about my work. So at that point, I did what many people do when they're under attack, and I turned inward. I even left Stanford in California and went back to my home in England, where I thought things were a little more sane. But after three years in England, Stanford kept asking me to come back, and one day I decided I would go back and I would fight. So I went back to Stanford, and I wrote up for a web page all that they had done to me. I just listed the accusations, the lies, the attacks, the ways they tried to suppress my research. And I remember the night I posted it very clearly. The rest of my faculty had gone to a faculty party. They don't really, they're not really as exciting as that, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I stayed home and I pressed publish. I published the web page. That night, I also joined Twitter and posted it on Twitter also. And then amazing things started happening. That weekend, the story went viral on Twitter. It became the most tweeted story in education that weekend. I was contacted by news journalists and many others. But something else interesting happened. Over the next few months, I started to receive letters and emails from women scientists, all of them detailing the academic bullying that they also had experienced. So this was a very clear sign to me that we're nowhere near gender equity in STEM in higher education. But I share this story for a different reason. What I want to share with you is how, when I opened up and I was vulnerable, but I connected with other people and I shared my story, amazing things started to happen. There was an outpouring of support, which was fantastic. And it has actually helped me get to the place where we are now, where our sharing of the same messages and videos and tasks and lessons have now had millions of downloads, and the connections that happened have really helped our messages get out there much more widely. So something else started to happen, though, when I made those connections, and that was I changed myself. I had been very sort of locked up inside, and the walls of ice I had constructed around my own feelings started to melt. And it was that uh, experience of having those connections that leads me to where I am today, where I'm sharing even more widely, this is a book that came out this month, the messages that these men hated so much. So I'd like to share with you today the six messages I have in this book. And I call them in the book keys because I believe that each of these key pieces of information have the power to unlock people in different ways. And the first key that I always share is the knowledge that we now have about our brains having limitless potential. We can learn anything. There's no such thing as a maths person or an English person or any other kind. The second key is the amazing evidence we have on the importance of struggle. When you're struggling, when you're finding something really difficult, 
When you're making mistakes, those are the best times for our brains. And studies show that when we make mistakes, synapses are firing. It's a really positive time for our brains. The third important key is what you believe about yourself actually changes your reality. And when you have a growth mindset and you believe in yourself, everything changes in your life, in learning, also in health. This is an interesting study. Researchers followed over 61,000 people over a 21-year time span. And they found that people who believed the exercise they were doing was healthy and good for them were actually more healthy than the people who didn't believe the exercise they were doing was really healthy, even though they were doing the exact same amount of exercise. And this is pretty important because the negative thinkers were 71% more likely to die in the follow-up period. So it's pretty important that we have these positive beliefs about ourselves. And this study showed this so clearly to me. This was a study of brains when people make mistakes from Jason Moser and his colleagues. And they found that when people with a growth mindset made a mistake, their brains, the orange brains, were on fire with growth compared to people with a fixed mindset. So this really shows us that what you believe about yourself will change how your brain operates. And it's important for all of us. It's very important for learners in schools, but for everybody who goes into any challenging situation, if you go into that situation and you think, I've got this, but then you fail or you mess up in some way, your brain will respond more positively than if you go into situations thinking, I don't think I can do this. That's how important that self-belief is. And this uh, image of brains really helps us understand data like this. This is the achievement of students going through maths classes with the same teachers the lower line, the flat line, is kids who had a fixed mindset. They didn't believe they could achieve anything. And the upward line is the kids with a growth mindset who believe that they could learn anything. Now we know why this happens. Those kids with a growth mindset, their brains are more active every time they make a mistake. So the fourth key I want to share with you is the importance of dealing with knowledge differently and seeing it from different perspectives. And I want to try something with you right now. Um, I'm going to give you a maths question and ask you to think about this in your head for a while. So my question is, what is the answer to 18 times 5? So if you think about that on your own for a little bit. And probably there are some people here who thought about that in this way. The traditional algorithm, lining up the numbers, multiplying five times eight, carrying a number across. Which is fine, that is a method. But there are many different ways of thinking about this question. This is one I like. We can realize that 18 times five is actually the same as nine times 10. And when we think about it visually, and you see a visual here that kind of explains that, when we think about it visually and we also think about it with numbers, that's what causes really important connections to happen in the brain. And the brain when wants to see and think about things in different ways, not just maths, but any knowledge. When you think about it in different representations and different forms, it causes this important brain connecting to happen. So the next key I talk about is thinking deeply and flexibly is much more important than speed. And there are actually two de very different ways of thinking. One way of thinking that algorithmic, rational knowledge, really valued in Western society, is actually a kind of knowledge that computers can do better than anybody in this room. This other kind of knowledge, flexible, creative knowledge, they are at ground zero at getting computers to think in these ways. And it is the ways of thinking we want our students to uh, develop. It's much more important or equally as important as that rational algorithmic knowledge. But we don't emphasize it enough in our education and schools, which we're hoping to change. 
And unfortunately, speed is the enemy of this deep and flexible knowledge. When we tell learners they have to do things quickly, it actually suppresses that part of the brain that's able to think flexibly and creatively. And then the final key I want to share with you is the power of connecting, connecting with people around knowledge and ideas. And I wanted to share with you a, a really important event as we think particularly about women in STEM. In 2012, the PISA international testing found that boys outperformed girls in maths in 38 countries. But when they factored in anxiety, they realized that difference was really one of anxiety and the girls were more anxious about taking that individualized maths test. But they also did something else interesting that year. They gave a test of collaborative problem solving. People took the test on their own, but they interacted with a computer agent to solve a complicated problem. Some pretty fantastic things happened when they gave that test. Girls outperformed boys in all 51 countries. There were also no differences between socioeconomically disadvantaged and advantaged kids. So really fantastic things that underscore, I think, why we want people collaborating, communicating, and how it's particularly, probably, important for girls and women. So my advice, really, for learners of any age is if you meet challenges, embrace them. They're really the great, great things for your brain. If you come up against barriers, find ways around them. There are always different ways to think, to work, and to act. If you meet opposition, as I did, connect with other people. That's important. And always reach for the stars, because even if you don't reach them, setting out on that journey will be helpful, especially if the perspective you take is limitless. So I'm going to finish with a couple of examples of great women in STEM, just to share with you uh, what they can do. And for me, being a woman in STEM is fantastic. But when you're a woman in STEM who shares your knowledge with other people to bring more people into STEM, then that really makes those people superpowered to me. So we're going to look at a couple of superpowered people. And the first one I want to share with you is Hayat Sindhi. She's a biotechnologist, a global ambassador, top scientist in the world. And what I love is how she's encouraging others, particularly girls, into STEM. And she talks about she also gets challenges to her work. And the higher up she goes, the more people, she says, don't want her to succeed and, and challenge her. But she also talks about how that's made her stronger and better able to deal with those challenges. And she also talks, I love the way she talks about getting more women into STEM is so important. And maybe if we had more women in STEM, we wouldn't have as many nuclear weapons or fast cars, but perhaps we'd have more cures for diseases and other humanitarian goals would be achieved. The second person I want to highlight is an amazing mathematician called Tai Denai. And I love what Tai Denai does because she has a blog site where she shares all her mathematical thinking. And she also talks about how she wasn't on a mathematics path until she had one teacher who taught in the ways I've been talking about as ideas instead of just methods to remember. And she's sharing that message now and wants to go out and teach other people in these ways. So something I love about both of these scientists is that they're inside the castle, but they're opening the doors to other people. They're sharing, they're being public, and they're talking about ways to get in. And that's really important. It's something we really need in STEM. So if you're a person who's working towards equity, as I know many of you are, my final message is this. The system is broken. We see that from the inequities in STEM. So if you're giving messages that aren't getting pushback, you're probably not being disruptive enough. So when you give different messages to people, expect that pushback and smile about it. Connect with other people and know that you're now a stronger person who's contributed to making a more equitable world. Thank you.